All right. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Tony, I like your pastel background. It kind of makes me feel like I need to like rub my eyes. <laughs> Uh, looks like we have a quorum. Uh, Ingrid said she might be a few minutes late. Charlie slash Steve Boyd said he might be a little bit late. Looks like he's here though. Uh, so <clears throat> I guess let's get it started. Is this Mr. Langhorst leading us off? Hello. That is me. I get the first two. So what I thought I would do real quick um, is kind of give you an update on where we're at with the water treatment plant and the no-name tunnel work. Should take just a minute. Um, and then we'll have a quick conversation about how you want to go under water rates. So um, first thing is we are working in the no-name tunnel. Our SWAT crew got everything cleared out of there and ready to go for the uh, main construction crew. Um, we got our radio communications up, our turbidity meters in. So we are now getting constant uh, feedback from the intake over there. Um, we have baffle walls built into the open basin now, and we're working on getting um, solid pipe or solid removals piping in there and the sediment packs in there. So we're, we're looking really good on that structure. Um, I won't say we're ahead of schedule, but I wouldn't say we're behind schedule on that one. Um, it's kind of a fill in project since it's much smaller than the water plant. Water plant, good news. Um, the water plant's made up of a pre treatment building and a filter building. Pre-treatment building has two sides to it. Uh, for this work, we took a whole entire side down, basically demolished everything in it, all the set packs, all the vacs, everything, completely rebuilt it. And last weekend, they got it completely filled back up and online. So half of the, the uh, sediment basin is already done, and we've already drained the other one, and we're demoing the other one to do the exact same thing. So we'll have both uh, said basins up and running here pretty soon, which is impressive. Um, the filters, there's four filters in the filter building. We took two down. Obviously, we got to run the building, so we left two up. Um, wiped everything out of the filters. They're basically big square boxes of concrete. Uh, we found that when we took everything apart, that if we had wanted to back flush those filters during a high sediment uh, uh, event, we would not have been able to in the existing conditions. Some of the piping and infrastructure was uh, cracked and had fallen apart, and we couldn't see it, so we didn't know that. Uh, so it's a good thing we kind of are doing this. Um, both of those filters were already done demoing, um, already have the um, uh, filters in and flow tested, and we're already putting material back in, which is basically mixed media, it's sand and other uh, materials on top of that. So they should be, those two should be up, disinfected and running by the end of next week. So we'll do the exact same thing. We'll, once the two are up and running, we'll flop over to the other two. Uh, demo those things out. We know a whole bunch more, so it'll go a little faster this go around. Um, but we are looking really good for being done in on time uh, for spring runoff with all of the work at the water plant and the no-name tunnel. So just want to give you guys a big thumbs up. Don't worry about that. It's going well. Um, so we should be ready for season. We should have water. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, then going into any questions on that? No. Uh, going into rate study, you know, we've talked about this several times now, um, and we only have 45 minutes to discuss this. Do you want an abbreviated version of the presentation, or do you want a full version of the presentation? You know, I feel like we've gotten the full version a couple of times, so maybe an abbreviated version with some notable differences from what we might have heard in the past. You got it. I'm going to share a screen here real quick. Is that okay with everybody else? Okay. Yeah, seeing a lot of thumbs up. It takes about 20 minutes and I don't know if I want to go through 20 minutes. <laughs> so let me rearrange myself here. Okay. Going into water and wastewater rate study. You guys have all seen this before. Um, I think some of the highlights are, you know, when we started this project, we hadn't had the Grizzly Creek fire. Um, when we did have the fire, we rearranged our priority list a little bit and knowing that the, the 50 million we were originally looking at was a big ask. Uh, we prioritized everything down as much as humanly possible and about to down to $36 million. And about 8 million of that is influenced by the Grizzly Creek fire, water plant things, uh, the additional pipeline going up the hill, no name tunnel, uh, all of those fun things. So that's about 18% of this $36 million ask in capital projects is part of the Grizzly Creek fire. Um, Good to note, maybe bad to note, you know, we haven't raised rates since 2015. 
Uh, so from 15 through 2021, it's been about five and a half, six years. You know, the city has not actually raised water rates. Uh, most of the communities around us have raised water rates during that time, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, um, one of the things is we do have a substantial amount of capital needs in the city. Um, you saw in the article, I think it was yesterday in the paper, I think Shannon did a really good job on that article. She wanted to know which streets we were going to have pipes replaced underneath. And I'm like, do you want the spreadsheet or just want me to type them out? You know, it was about 25 or so, 28 streets that she had in the article and she had to columnize them because uh, there's so many of them. And to, to make that point is, is like, we're, we're, we're not asking for money that we don't need. Um, we want to replace infrastructure. We want to make sure everybody is safe uh, and has fire uh, flow capabilities within their street and their fire hydrants. Um, a lot of this is within the streets themselves, but it's also the, the 8 million we're spending on plants. Um, in 2022, amazingly enough, uh, next year will be a 10 years for the new wastewater plant. It's not so new anymore. Um, even some of the technology we have in there is outdated after 10 years. So we'll be doing kind of an overhaul um, of that plant and spending somewhere around a half a million dollars on it uh, to bring blowers, pumps, SCADA systems, those kinds of things back up to date. Um, sorry. Um, I just want to bring this one up real quick. This, you know, if we don't raise rates, this is what we look like at this point. What we're asking for with um, the cost of chemicals, labor, um, cost of capital projects, debt coverage, those kinds of things. This is what we're asking for is basically these little bars that are going up. <laughs> um, and what we have right now for money coming in is this red line coming across. So you can see there's, there's quite a discrepancy as the years go on uh, between the two. Thus why we're looking at two options to potentially move forward with, with the city and rate increases. Um, you know, Matt, option, yeah. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Boom. You got and it. Just, just explain a little bit about that light bluish purple that's above the red line for 2020. So this one right here? For 2020, yes. Mm -hmm. So 2020, we spent a lot of money um, you can see we went from about six up to $10 million. And this is, a lot of that is um, Cedar Crest. Okay. So we had a huge capital investment this year. Some of this is the fire, some of this is Cedar Crest, but those are the capital investments that we made in 2020. You know, and if we had known at the beginning of the year we were gonna have a fire and we were gonna completely rebuild our plant, we might've made a different decision, to be honest with you. Um, our intent is to throw as much capital funds as we have at street um, or water and sewer improvements. But if I'd known I was gonna get doubled up on this year with $8 million worth of uh, upgrades for plants and pipes, and I might've skipped Cedar Crest. Don't tell them I said that. Um, no, but it'd be, <laughs> it'd be nice to have that two and a half million dollars back at this point. But that's what this little purple is here. Every year it's infrastructure um, improvements. Um, and then green is also infrastructure improvements as we move past 2022 partially, but it's considered net debt service. Um, so we'll increase our, increase our debt service to help pay for some of these infrastructure improvement projects. Um, but moving into this, this is the dreaded page that we are all debating at this point. Um, you know, we're looking at two options to help us cover all of these expenses, either option one, um, which is a 26% increase in 2021, with a 888 uh, in 22, 23, and 24 going to seven and 25. And then uh, for the five year remaining years in the 10 year program, it would go to 5%. Or option two is to kind of rip the band aid off option, uh, which is 36% increase, and then uh, followed up with 5% increases thereafter uh, to continue uh, covering these needs that we no longer, we're not covering in this red line. Um, I will speed this up a little bit. I think this is a very important chart. Steve put this together, but everybody's like, what if you just do, you know, 5% or 6% or 7% or whatever it is for a year for the, the 10 years? It doesn't, it doesn't catch us up. We are behind the eight ball right now. Um, we are actually, we're almost paying people to take water partially last year and this year, um, which is why in 2019, we started this conversation about a rate study and we were hoping to implement in early 2020. Um, but we could not do that during COVID. Uh, so it's gotten pushed a whole entire another year to be on it. And that has kind of put us even farther behind the eight ball uh, at this point. But you can see 
hopefully you can see in the chart, you know, the, the rip the bandaid off approaches this 36% increase on the blue here, followed by the, the, the fives after that. And then the partially rip the bandaid off is the orange one here, which is the 26%, and then the sevens and eights into the five. But the point of the chart is, is you can see that if you do a very small increase to get to where we need to be, it takes a little longer. Uh, if you do the medium increase, it takes a little bit longer to get up to this 2 million range. So all of this area underneath of these charts here above the blue line is an additional cost to the bill that people are going to pay by deferring spending and deferring um, capital uh, loans. So in essence, the blue one is painful, but in the long run, ripping the Band-Aid off is actually cheaper because we can borrow money sooner. We can borrow at low interest rates. We're not kicking projects down the, the street um, that are going to increase somewhere between four and 5% in costs every single year. So in essence, if you wait 10 years to do a project, you're gonna pay somewhere around 50% more for that project than you would have 10 years previously. So it's the cost of services and the cost of capital um, being deferred out. So the blue one is painful up front, but in essence, it catches up very, very quickly. And it actually is the least expensive one uh, when you look at overall billings. Uh, we've all seen this one. It was actually in the paper the other day. Um, and these are combined bills. This is water and sewer together. You know, you can see that if you go with option one, which is the 26% up front, it's about 18 to $26 difference on your average bill. If you go with option two, your average bills will go up 26 to $37. So yes, it is, it is painful. Um, I totally agree with that. I know people are unhappy about it. If we had raised rates 6% over the last five years, we'd have a very different conversation right now, but we didn't. So um, we kind of put ourselves in this position. Um, option two and one, this is the red line we were looking at before. You can see this is the new red line. If we increase rates, we're actually covering debt services, capital costs, labor increase, material increase, all those fun things. Um, and option two, we're just doing it a little bit faster. You can see that we're not quite covering on these first few years. Option two gives us that opportunity. And then it also, um, uh, cash balances build back up faster because we like to keep somewhere between four and $6 million, preferably six, um, in cash reserves, which is just smart business practice. Um, we're going to be pretty short on cash reserves by the end of this year. Um, if we don't get some help in financing, we'll be pretty close to being out of money by the end of this year. Um, these are just debt service coverages. You can see, you know, if we go with option um, one, we're barely doing 125% debt coverage. If we go option two, we're almost up at 150% debt coverage, which is what the banks prefer to see. This one's really not pertinent, but it is a question people ask. They're like, well, how much why is water so much more expensive at 2000 than it is at 10,000? It's, it's not. We have those base fees, which are the 13 and the $66. So basically your base fee divided by $2,000 gives you a higher number. Once you start using more water, the base fee affects that price per gallon a little bit less as you go up. So the cost of water goes up, but then it defers off the, the volume base divide, divided by the base fee kind of spreads out a little bit more versus just an initial hit um, that we see. Bigger points, and I'll probably only hit two more slides, maybe three. Um, this is kind of where we fall in the world of our valley. Um, right now we're at about $107 on average for an existing bill. This would bump us as we saw up about to $134 for option one and $145 for option two. So there is a, a good $38 increase in the options, which is the 36.8% um, that we're asking for. But you can still see that, you know, Town of Silt is here, City of Rifle is here, Town of Silt is also here because they have two different fees for irrigation. Um, and Carbondale's right in the middle. So I know it seems like a big ask, um, but we're not actually going so far out of the realm that we're charging about what we would be charging about what other communities are. And if we had done those 6% increases over the years, we'd be in the same boat. We'd be right about here. Um, we're just asking for it all at once instead. Um, oh, I skipped my page. And that's kind of where I wanted to go to. This isn't a new thing for the Valley. Um, everybody's kind of looked at their water rates and people are continuing to look at their water rates. I've actually had several communities reach out to me and ask how we did our uh, rate study and who we used. Um, but 
and I'm not throwing any of these people under the bus. This is just what they did. You know, the, the town of Carbondale did a rate increase um, right off the bat. They raised their uh, flat rates 5% and 7.5% because they do water sewer also. And then they set up a program between 2017 and 2024 to raise percentages, um, basically 5% all the way across. Uh, so if you take that time frame, you multiply it out. I mean, they're raising rates around 47% which is probably what we should have done also. That's why we're setting up this program, um, just like Carbondale did. We're having a little bigger hit in the front end. Um, oops. Uh, Basalt is a good one, super example, not throwing uh, Robbie under the bus or anything, but they did the same thing. They sat on the rates for five years, uh, from 2013 all the way to 2018, they realized there was a problem. They raised their water rates 48% in one shot. They had to just had to cover costs. They were doing the same thing. They were starting to spend money um, to pay people basically to use water. Um, so they had to raise the rates. Rifles, kind of the worst case example. Um, once again, no offense to them, um, but they needed a new water plant. So what did they do? They were so far in that they had to ask for a 0.75% sales tax to cover the new water plant. And you can see that's the sales tax. And you heard the discussions and probably read the article the other day that uh, JVA is uh, recognized they have $164 million worth of issues through 2040. Um, so, you know, rifles rates are gonna go up and they were already one of the higher ones on this chart here. I think Minturn was the only higher one, um, but they had some sewer issues a few years ago, which is why they got thrown in there. So um, I can skip a lot of the rest of these things. There's reasons why, I mean, we've talked about all of them. Um, but my point is, is this is not a new thing. Water is starting to increase everywhere. Um, costs of creating that water and being code compliant is getting harder and harder every year. And the lack of water is making it so people have to have secondary, third, fourth uh, viable options to get water into the city so we can supply water and not have to put large water restrictions on the community. So unless there's an opposition to it, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> And you guys can ask questions and, and uh, start talking. Who's got questions? Oh, hold on a sec. Let me get to the participant. Okay, there we go. Well, I don't see too many hands up. And I, I think that Matt is probably a reflection on the fact that this is, I think, the third time we've heard this. And it's, uh, we started hearing about that last summer we had a you know we had another work session in october i think we had something uh earlier this year so i think we're familiar with it but is, are is there any tony's got his hand up oh sorry go ahead tony yeah thank you matt what 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 factor is tap fees and this council and prior counselors waiving of tap fees is that not a big deal or is that just a small amount or how does that figure into this shortfall thank you well, tap fees are obviously largely dependent on what development comes in. You know, if we get a 300 unit development that comes in and they're going to pay water and sewer tap fees are in the realm of $11,000 per EQR, um, that can make a huge difference in system improvement fees. But we try to spend those fees on system improvements, which are a new water tank, a replacement of a lift station, the water plant itself. We don't, we don't try to spend those on pipes because that is a system improvement, but it's a very limited system improvement. It's 500 feet of pipes. We try to keep that money in the pot. So when the water plant <laughs> um, fails or we have to replace everything inside of it, that we have money. And we do have the money to do that. Um, it's just going to kind of drain us down because we spent a pretty decent amount of um, other revenues that we had sitting there on Cedar Crest. Once again, needed to be done uh, kind of thing, but we probably wouldn't have spent all of it at one time and phased it in. So I don't, I couldn't tell you how much of effect that has. I don't know how many system improvement fees we've deferred over the years. Um, but it's definitely a, it's a good thing for people to try to do affordable housing, which is kind of a key to it and a few other things, but we kind of, we kind of make up those monies within the volume of uh, water and sewer sold. Thank you. Thank you. Tony, just because Shelly and I were have bound council for four years and I'll just speak for on behalf of the two of us that we have not, this this council that Shelley and I for the last four years have been on have never once, as far as I know, waived any tap fees or system improvement fees for any developer. 
other than I think we wrote a letter of support like six months ago for that potential uh, affordable housing complex behind um, uh, discount tires. But I don't think we've waived any. Is that your understanding as well, Deborah? And Carl can correct me here if I'm wrong, but I mean, I think in our, the units we've created with the affordable housing program that we had, some of those would have been waived. Oh, okay. But, but and, and that's what I was going to say. And I don't, Matt, it can, I, I think it's a relatively low number overall. Um, and that was, you know, that was kind of a balance point on, do we, do we waive those fees to encourage that housing product um, with the need for housing? Um, Jen probably knows the exact number, but I think um, I, it, 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 it's, it's small in comparison. And even the, the, units behind discount tire, I don't think we put um, at least water system improvement fees were not on the table as part of that package um, because of exactly this issue that we wanted to make sure that we had the maximum amount in the fund to, to help uh, with those projects, so. Thanks, uh, Paula. Hey Matt, do you know what the, um average CPI is year to year in the last, say, three to five years? So it depends on which CPI you use. Okay, so, so we've you... used that in reference to these discussions saying, oh, we could go up 5% or the CPI rate. So I'm just trying to get a sense of... Um... So the system improvement fees are based off of what used to be like the Lakewood Aurora Denver CPI, which we probably shouldn't have picked one because that one is now the, I want to say the Boulder Denver Fort Collins CPI or something. And last year it went up like 1.9%. Uh, the previous years, it's usually between two and a half and three and a half percent. Call it inflation if that's what you want to call it. Um, Brian Mance is on, he kind of looked around and said, there's actually a water and sewer CPI for the entire United States. Um, and it goes up around 48 to 4.9% is on average over, I want to say the last 20 or 30 years. So wholly depends on which CPI you use. Locally, you're in the three to three and a half, whatever. If you use the water sewer one that Brian had brought up about three weeks ago, you know, it's in the four to four and a half to five percent range. Yeah, I'm more concerned about what our average citizen looks at, not just the water and sewer, but just to get generally. So you're saying around three percent, two to two to half to three percent. Jen, Jen might be able to answer that locally better. I just look at the, the Denver ones because they're kind of consistent. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Paula. Shelly. Unmuted here. Um, and, and Matt, so the way that you, that we're looking at the rate increase right now that would carry all of the burden for the capital improvements correct we're we're not considering um any grant income and we're not considering any any uh portion from the capital projects fund correct since we can't can't guarantee that we're going to get grants i mean we do fairly well on them for sure um, you know, DOLA is always generous to us, but at some point they're going to have to go to somebody else for a little while. Uh, we did get a half a million from them this year for one of those uh, pipe projects that we're working on because of the fire. Um, we're always looking for grant opportunities. Um, USDA is always out there. They'd rather give you a low interest loan than a grant because they have less grant funds than the loan funds. Um, and we're talking to them on some of these things. So I mean, 36 million is, is the knockdown number from 50, what we really need to do. And since I can't guarantee I'm gonna get a grant, that's what we're looking at. Okay, okay. And then as far as, you know, when, when you go back in kind of the history of the Capital Projects Fund, and if you look at the definition of the Capital Projects Fund, it is specifically for public works capital projects. And they used to transfer between 600,000 a year and 800,000 a year into water and the sewer funds to help with capital projects. I, I can take that one, Shelley. When I got, okay. when I came to Glenwood, I think it was already down to around 600,000. And right. from my understanding at the time is it's when the wastewater treatment plant was built to avoid increasing the rates to probably where they should have been increased. There was a compromise and that compromise said they could start around 800,000. It was supposed to go down $160,000 a year, which it did to about 160 
And then we just stopped, I believe, at the direction of city council at the time. Okay. So it okay. was a short term thing. I don't think it was ever meant to be long term. And just council, of course, can determine where any of these funds are used. Council just has to understand that we have way more capital needs all over the city than we can possibly fund with the amount of revenue we have. So you're making choices about what we fix and what we don't fix. And I already have more than I can fix. Right. Yeah. And I, I guess I I just need to weigh those choices, you know, personally is, is how much of that burden do we put on the rate payer? And it does look like, you know, Matt's done a great job of showing us what some of the surrounding towns are doing, you know, that we, we're not going to be real high in comparison to some of the surrounding communities. And water is not cheap. Water's historically been underpriced and, and it's, it's expensive and it's getting more valuable as, a, as the drought goes on too. And it's, it's not a low cost thing to supply to the citizens. But I guess um, I have to weigh kind of, you know, do we, do we put all the burden on the, on the rate payers or do we supplement that a little bit with something from the capital projects fund which brings in a little over two million a year right now, and it's and it's for public works type projects, and that lets the sales tax kind of pay for that and can put a little bit of the burden. As we know, I think over seventy percent of our sales tax is paid by people outside or or either visitors or people outside of Glenwood Springs. So it kind of takes a little bit of that burden off. Um, Again, I, I realize that's a purely political decision, but I, I know for now Capital Projects is funding the ERP upgrade, which is very important to get our technology upgraded for the whole city systems. So I'm not arguing that, but if that sunsets in a couple of years, I guess I'm just looking for other sources of funding that we might be able to reduce that 5% that per year increase on our rate payers. There we go. Uh, Steve, and then Paula again. And we have 18 minutes, just so we know where we're at with time. Uh, Matt, I'm just wondering, does everybody pay the same water rate or are we discounting water to some users because of the volume that they use? No, um, commercial and residential are slightly different. And the more water you use, the more you pay for it. So, I've got, I don't have it right in front of me. I should have pulled that up. You know, the first 5,500 gallons is $2 per thousand gallons. And then it goes to $4 after that. And then it goes to $6. So the more water you use, the more you get penalized for using it. So we only have two tiers right now. So the bigger users kind of leave that upper tier really quickly and they get really penalized for that upper tier, <laughs> you know, um, like I've told a couple of people, we're still looking at other options on ways to bill for water, you know, with the, the potentially the metered rate, you know, so the, the smaller meters pay a lo little lesser rate for the meter for their flat rate and the bigger meters pay a little more. It's not a huge change if you start thinking about how many meters there are, um, but it could e equalize it a little bit and then probably including a few extra tiers into it, which is why I want to keep Brian on kind of on staff. Uh, through 2021 so he and I and staff can kind of hash out anything that we can do to improve what we do to make it more if you want to call it equitable um, but yes the like the hotel Colorado I always pick on Christian because he's always on here he pays the same flat rate um, beginning flat rate as a house does but he leaves that upper tier of water usage very very quickly and then pays an exuberant amount for those uh, that upper amount of water uh, so whether it's commercial or residential, it's the same rate. Gotcha. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Charlie. So I pulled up the capital projects fund to show you and I talked about this earlier. You know, when you start looking at this, we have 400 cents of the ERP and I don't know how many years is left of that. Then we have another 200 and 70,000 that's going into other IT and IT has become an increasing burden on every government or, or entity such as us. And you gotta be up with IT or they're gonna get hacked and 
the cost of that would be tremendous. And then you look at the other cost, you got almost $900,000 in fixing things. You know, we got all these buildings around town. We got to fix them. We got to keep them good maintenance. Um, and uh, there's various other funds. Those are the big numbers out there. And, and, the, and then we have, of course, you know, we have the, the uh, fleet fund and things like that that needs to be funded every year. We need to buy new vehicles and things. I, I, I think aspirationally, the idea of devoting money for the capital projects tax to this would be great, but I don't think, I think if we did so, it would be a bad move on our part because we're gonna to have to defer other projects that are being maintained. And then we put ourselves in a hole in that stuff. And I just don't think that makes overall economic sense. Um, I don't like this rate increase. I don't think any of us would like to do this, uh, but it's it's the only practical thing in my view that we can do. You know, and I guess it's gonna be my view that we should, um, direct staff to um, do the 36% increase. <clears throat> I know one of the concerns raised before has been, what do people on fixed income do? Deborah and I have been working with uh, River Center and Rifle about a program that would be fairly low cost to the city, that would be managed by River Center. We could help the people that have fixed incomes, you know, people with the, uh, the an area immediate income. I thought, I looked on the, uh, the uh, housing stuff we have in the area medium income for one, person is 59 and a couple is 67,000. And most of those people that would qualify would be in those areas. And if they own homes or, or they're gonna be impacted otherwise by this, that will help pay for that, that Delta. Uh, we don't really have a, a very large non-payment of, of rates. So it's not where we have to help these people with the current rates, it's we might need to help them with the, the upgrade for a year or two and let them kind of get used to it and budget for that extra money. So I, I think that's where we have to go. It's not good. It, if we can raise, you know, if you've got a million dollar grant or somewhere down in the future, then maybe we've got the bonds earlier. We can then, we can, we can reach back down or not make the 5% increases. And, you know, as far as the automatic increases, you know, I think we need to look at that every year. I mean, every council's but it can't buy the future councils, but putting something into a, a rate structure that would say, all right, in April of every year, or whatever time the staff tells us we should do that, is we say we're going to do 5% unless we look at it in the month of April every year. We say we don't need it this year, so we're not going to increase it 5%. Maybe we'll do 2%. So we put some, we build that into the ordinance so we're required to, to look at that every year. Because I think the 5% is the other thing that really causes concern among, among people. Uh, but we can't get behind. Here's my last comment as I had a conversation with one of the local contractors. And I said, why is construction costs go up 5% every year? And the response was that he has to pay his employees 5% more every year just to maintain good quality workforce. We know that within City Hall, but we have to do that. So my soapbox is we have no choice. Um, it's, it's unfortunate it's gotta be such a big stab in one year, but we have no choice. We have got to get this stuff done. It's life safety issues for if we got a fire coming down, we can't fight a fire in our local residence because we don't have water pressure. It's not something that I want to look at. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. Um, oh, I'm going to mute you, Charlie. There we go. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I was muting Charlie. He's unmuting himself. I think we're both trying to mute himself because there's some feedback. Uh, you know, I, I would say. People, uh, just this morning, I was on an airport commission and Dave Merritt's on the airport board commission. And I said, what a fun uh, work session we're going to have tonight talking about water rates. And he said, uh, you know, 20 years ago when I was on council, we said we would raise them every year consistent with CPI. So we didn't have to have this kind of conversation. Problem is politics got in the way. About playing politics and I know Shelly and I, you know, we, we nod on each other, not on each other, but we, we nod with each other about uh, a previous council's decision to raid the landfill fund and the fleet fund to pay for um, nice to have projects like a parking garage downtown. And I, I think, you know, there's people say, you know, if only government could run like a business, then, then everything would be better. Well, government's not a business. We don't have shareholders. We don't have dividends. We don't have bought stock buybacks. You know, we, we do, but those shareholders are citizens. The buyback, the stock buybacks are quality of life. And so, you know, this is one of those rare times I really do feel like we should operate like a business and not rob Peter to pay Paul, not look at 
rating the capital fund or the fleet fund or the landfill fund. One, because it's been rated for years and we need, to, this is an enterprise fund. Taking money out of the capital fund, which is a general, um, uh, a general fund expense and, and transferring it to something that is an enterprise fund to bail it out because of previous half measures and political considerations, I think has got us where we're at, which is every council that kicks a can down the road because this is a really hard decision to have. And I would love to just raise it 8% and go, looks like I'm gonna be off council in about four years. That's that's somebody else's problem, but I don't think that that's responsible and I don't, I don't think we can do that. So um, I, I'm always open to other ideas or, or you know, if, if uh, Deborah in the next, you know, couple months is able to score a, uh, you know, a $10 trillion, uh, sorry, excuse me, trillion, $10 million, I uh, was thinking in infrastructure money from feds, uh, a $10 million grant, then absolutely we can have this conversation again. But I, I think I, I hesitant to, to put this conversation off um, or to figure out ways we can get more money out of other funds because we, we've just, we're at this position now because previous councils have done things like this. So. Uh, Shelly, last word. I just, as far as giving direction on this for now, I, I definitely agree with Charlie. I think if we can write it into anything that we'll be voting on and adopting for an annual review of a rate increase, that would be really important. And then I definitely would like to see the, sir, the base month amount service hookup charge you know, adjusted to meter size. And I know, Matt, you said you probably can't do that yet. Are we waiting on ERP upgrades or that kind of thing or well, other data? I think you, you explained. Well, what it comes down to is we have about 3,700 of them in the city and we hand them out, but we have them basically labeled in a hard copy. We don't have it in a digital database. So between working okay. hours and trying to get keep the city going, the guys are slowly but surely gathering that database together to say that Shelly Kopp has a three quarter inch at her house. I have a three quarter at my house. Christian's got a six inch at the hotel or whatever it is and put those with the accounts so that we actually have a record in a digital format, which would be spectacular, um, okay. Okay. You know, so that we can start working on that. We've, already, just, worked, we've already worked on the tiers with Brian uh, we need to get the meters worked out. Okay, and I think that's important to see that. I'd love to see commercial hookups pay a little bit of a higher a business rate. You know, we've talked about this with electrical also. I think it's important to get that kind of equity thing built into so that, you know, a, a couple or a person that's on a fixed income and in a small apartment or home is not paying the same hookup rate as a, as a business or as a large user. That's it. Uh, okay, Paula, last words. Um, so I, I agree, we need to do something this year. We need to do a rate increase. I'm concerned about stretching it out into the future. Um, I don't want this to be a backdoor to approving um, a street tax that was before the voters two years ago, but I do think we need to look at a repeal and replace of our current street tax to look at potential funding from that source. Um, grants, I know you can't guarantee them, but they're out there um, and they continually come through and there's a lot of stuff coming up right now with uh, um just with what's happening at the federal level and some opportunities that are right out the door. So um, I think that we should leave that door open for that potential in the future, but not bind us to the higher rate increase each year. Um, as I mentioned in an earlier meeting, I am concerned when we start looking at, you know, people in town at a house, raising a family, having to pay 183 to 200 dollars a month by 2030 that's just a big part of your budget and um, that's scary it's much scarier to me even than this initial first year that we have to do and we have to make up for stuff so i'd like to propose that um, we get this first rate increase um, figure out um, um, if we're going 26 or 36 percent and then say we're at a minimum of a cpi increase each year with the council discussion to see if we have to go higher than that um, depending on what else has come through the door and what other opportunities are before us. So 
I'd like to start low rather than start high and having to work ourselves talking backwards so that we can take care of our community. Um, so that's where I'm standing on this right now. And I hope we can consider that. You're muted, Jonathan. Thanks. We have five minutes. Uh, Matt, briefly, and then Charlie, I promise everybody that this you will have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I say this because I live in the city and I have a lot of neighbors. This is not a pleasant conversation for me. This is not a realization that I wanted to come to while looking at budgets. You know, we came to this realization almost two years ago. And because of the world situation, it's just coming to the head now. But, you know, <laughs> I want to make sure we have water for the future. I want to make sure we're drought resistant. And I want to make sure our pipes don't explode in, in the ground. Um, so I, I understand this is a very difficult conversation for Paula, for all of you, and it's not a pleasant conversation for me either. So just want to let you bring that up. No, I understand that, Matt. <laughs> My neighbors may not talk to me after this. We'll see. <laughs> Charlie, go ahead. Just to briefly respond to Paula. I, I agree. If we did the, the, the smaller increase and that made economic sense, I would support it. But Overall, the citizen is going to pay more if we don't get money from somewhere. Um, I don't remember the, the the difference in numbers Matt gave, but I think we just we got to we got to do the bigger increase and get the money get going. And if we get money, we can always reduce rates. It, it's just harder to charge people more over the next twenty years or ten years. I guess is what we're looking at because we didn't take the bigger bite now. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't say which to pick for the initial char um, Charlie. I just said moving forward, we need to start at CPI moving up. Sorry, I misinterpreted, I apologize. <clears throat> okay, um, thank you, Matt. Thank you everybody for comments. And uh, I think this will come back before us probably next month to make a decision on. All right, next item, I believe it's, oh, it's Matt again. Broadband Town of Eagle IGA draft scope of services. You have 15 minutes. <laughs> if you could find, I think Michael Gardner is out there someplace. Yeah, I can promote him. That'd be great. Ah, uh, he's not. He's not in an attendee. If he's out there, I don't see him. Michael. One moment, please. World technology, I can do multiple things at one time here. <laughs> Well, I'll start anyhow. Um, so you guys have seen this before. What we were talking about is the town of Eagle is moving forward with a fiber to home project also. Um, they have gone out, they've done design and, and uh, coordination with Uptown, actually the same consultants we have. Um, and they would like to move forward with the project. The only real feasible way they can move forward with the project after looking at all kinds of options is um, if the city of Glenwood Springs is here to help support them a little bit. And what that means is, hold on, I'm getting a beat from Michael. 10 seconds, he says. So what that means is um, staffing. It's very expensive to staff a, a customer service rep, a marketing rep, um, people that are 24 hours a day to come fix things, uh, those kinds of things. So since we're building out and we already have those staff on hand at this point, um, what we'd be basically doing is splitting some scope of services with them. We would hire ourselves out. Uh, basically, every time they'd hire or get another customer on that customer, they would actually pay us $10 per customer. Um, over the time, if they have a thousand customers, it'd be $10 a month per customer. We'd be doing, we'd be making money. It helps us cover our staffing on this end because we're still a small uh, broadband network. We're not Comcast where there's thousands of people. Uh, we're a small broadband network. So anytime we can work our people up to 100% of usage, we'll call it, um, not 110, not 150%, but 110, 100% of usage that is beneficial to us. Um, so it's good that it's good. It helps us pay for our system. It helps cover our people and it allows them to not have to hire immediately on all of these people uh, to run their system. So it's in the packet. There's quite a bit of information uh, what the scope of services are, what Eagle's responsibilities are, and what Glenwood's responsibilities are. And I asked Michael if he could kind of 
narrowed down uh, in a five minute <laughs> version um, of what this really means to everybody. Um, then you guys can ask questions after that, if that's all right. Michael, you're up. Cool. Uh, thanks for having me today, City Council. Thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do my absolute very best to keep it under five minutes. You'll have the, the document um, kind of getting into a bit more detail of outlining the scopes of uh, our different parties, you know, agreements, I guess. Um, the spirit of, of this agreement is really how do, we, how do we leverage the efficiencies of scale between our two communities? Um, I think we've talked about before how you know, this, this ERP or this customer record system that we're investing in and bringing up for the city of London Springs can be scaled to support the Eagle, the town of Eagles customers as well with, you know, they don't really need to hire or implement or do all the steps that we've done to get the same functionality of the system uh, because we've already done it. Um, so like at a, at a high level, that's really the, you know, the goal of this agreement is to how do we best work together to make both of our projects as sustainable and successful as they can be. Um, you know, and the, I'm looking at my notes here and I'm skipping around. I'm terrible from reading from my cards versus just, I go off on tangents all the time. Um, Realistically, we're going to be largely providing back-end administrative support um, and various technical expertise and technical uh, functionality for Eagle. Um, a lot of the niche skill sets that they're not necessarily big enough to support by themselves. Um, with, our, with our study and with what we're doing in Glenwood Springs, we can support these roles and functions without this partnership with Eagle. Um, but it makes it easier to, uh, if we do have Eagle kind of partner with us and leverage some of these skill sets, we'll be bringing on board regardless. Um, a lot of the network engineering design, the outside plant support um, and call center support are kind of the large pieces of, of where we're gonna be providing services to Eagle from. Um, in, this, in the document that you've got in front of you, um, you'll notice Eagle does have some full-time employees in their broadband department. So we're not gonna be going to Eagle anytime, you know, one of their customers has a tech related issue. We're not gonna roll a truck to Eagle for any and all reasons. They're gonna maintain some level of internal staff to take care of the day-to-day -day kind of operation, but you know, the higher level troubleshooting, the higher level support, if they have a fiber outage, we're going to respond to that. Um, and we're going to be taking, you know, the lion's share of their support calls and their help desk or their, you know, customer installation calls. Um, yeah, and hopefully that was less than five minutes. <laughs> And it, just to clarify, when Michael says ERP, you guys all think what Steve Boyd does and what Yvette are working on. The, the um, CBN has its own software that does its own billings. You can go online, you can sign up for service, change your services, it bills you for it. So it, they have their own ERP, we'll call it. So I just want to get those two things confused between the, the main one and the, the CBN version of that. So basically we're support staff, we're helping with support staff for Eagle um, CSR is a lot of that is the customer service reps. So, um, this is kind of where we're at, I guess, questions, like I said, we've kind of talked about this before. Charlie, Tim Polo and Shelly. Yeah. Just kind of one quick one, Michael or, or Matt, as I read the, the uh, information, this is a win-win for both Eagle and Glenwood. At some point there may come a point where it would make, it doesn't make sense where we would have to staff up and that we wouldn't have to do just to serve Glenwood. I assume that we can figure out when that's going to be and have an out in the agreement that we do. Is that, is that what the understanding of everybody is, the Eagle and Glenwood? That, that is correct. There may be a point where Eagle's not that big, <laughs> but there may be a point where if we had to hire another staff member to help cover that, you know, at that point, we would have a conversation of maybe $10 isn't enough. If they want us to do that, do you want to hire your own person on at that time? to help cover 
maybe a gap in time or a gap in calls or something to that effect. So this is basically to get them off of the ground. Um, if they've never hit that break, break even point, if you want to call it that for us, then great. If we do get to that point, then we'll make a business decision because this is a business. It's an enterprise fund now. Um, and we'll have to make the proper business decision at that moment. And I agree with that. And I appreciate that. I guess my concern is, is I've watched Eagle over 45 years and it's much bigger than it was five, 45 years ago. And they're in the same down valley pressure that we're having from Aspen and they've got room to grow. So we just got to be careful. That's all. Thank you. We have a lot more flat area than we do. Paula, go ahead. Um, that unmute button. Um, so do we have the capacity if there's a um, if there's a major major outage in Eagle and there's a big problem here? Are we going to have the capacity of staff to kind of handle two incidents at once or any other major catastrophe like a fire in Glenwood Canyon? I'm just trying to sense what that cost would be to us. Michael, you want to try that one? Sure. Um, from, from the inception of the discussions with Eagle about this partnership and, and largely from, from the philosophy that CBN has had as long as I've been here, um, the reliability and robustness of our network is, is kind of number one concern. Um, the, the details of the agreement with Eagle as they relate to fiber outer support and and support in that regard are like, I guess they're backed or they're, they're talked about with a service level agreement in place. Um, so if there is an outage in Eagle, we have X hours of, or X number of hours to respond to that type of thing. Um, and, and yeah, like if there's a big fiber cut in Eagle and a big fiber cut in Glenwood Springs, you know, how do we allocate those resources? And I think largely from how CBN has operated in the past and where we're moving to in the future, we can internally handle uh, a couple fiber events happening at the same time. Um, at some point, you know, like we obviously can't plan for every eventuality. If six fibers get cut all at once, we got a bad day ahead of us. Um, but it's, we do have, you know, we are thinking about, you know, maintaining our own, our own reliability and our own service. And, and my position is, and I think uh, Matt's is as well, is whatever we do in partnership with other communities, we have to ensure that our service remains unaffected from the reliability and the uptime standards we have set for ourselves. Thank you. Shelly. Sure. Uh, my question is similar along the lines as Paula's, but a little bit different. I'm just wondering if, if um, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of chatter in the community. People are interested in this. They're, they want to know when they can get signed up, things like that. So I'm wondering if part of the business model, do we have goals for customer service? Because that was always part of the model is that if, if we're going to have a lot of market uptake on this, we, we need to have excellent customer service and, you know, as one of our utilities and that people are happy with it and very satisfied. So just looking for that, do we have goals on customer service? Will working with Equal, do we have the bandwidth to keep up that service level and keep our customers happy? Because I, I don't want to see our customers sacrificed because we're serving um, the Eagle area. So if you could speak to that, that would be great. Well, I'll kick it off and Michael can cap it off. Um, right now we have one customer service rep on board because we don't have, we are slowly migrating people over to the new system. You know, Michael will make an announcement hopefully here soon on when people can really start hopping on. Uh, but we, the system is up, the system is running um, and we are migrating some people over onto it at this point. So we have one customer service rep. Um, Michael and I have been debating back and forth a little bit in the pro forma, there's three. So we have full time, three full-time customer service reps that cover the timeframes associated with when uh, you expect to call and, and somebody's to answer the phone, um, which is okay. part of your agreement. You're, if you call at this time to this time, somebody will answer the phone. If you call in between 
it'll be an emergency number if it's an emergency or leave a message and they'll get back to you at this time in the morning kind of thing. So, you know, we've been debating a little bit on not hiring another full-time, but maybe hiring a part-time uh, okay. person. So there's, we kind of, we don't overbuild ourselves with these people. So they're sitting around and doing nothing. Um, Cause when you're only at a hundred people, you're probably only getting a few calls a day. When you hit that 500 people, okay, now you're getting more calls in the day if there's issues or my box is down or I want to do this or that or whatever it is. Um, but we have- okay. three What about um, besides like emergency, besides service calls, what about just turnaround time on get, getting people hooked up, getting them started? So we have a subcontractor for actually getting people hooked up. Um, and maybe Michael wants to go over kind of their scope. I could talk for hours and hours, so please stop me. Uh, <laughs> you <have> four minutes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah, Matt's right. Uh, we are bringing on board a contractor to perform initial installations for our service. Uh, this includes, like you've probably seen pedestals and weird boxes hanging from the overhead lines around town. Um, the install work includes a cable from that pedestal or that box on the pole to the person's house and then the premise wiring from the box on the exterior of the house, inside the house, and the installation of the, you know, the wireless router or the piece of equipment we put there. Um, the company we have chosen, uh, I don't know if we've technically awarded the bid yet, but the company we are in discussion with um, is, is the reason they exist is they perform this function for other fiber of the home deployments. Uh, they are planning on putting staff in Glenwood Springs to support our installation volume. The RFP we put out to, to solicit proposals for this work um, included our kind of worst case, highest expected volume, um, and they didn't bat an eye with those numbers. So it's, it's we're going to be, as service becomes available and as our initial kind of wave or market penetration and marketing push all come together. Um, our kind of goal or our expected uh, turnaround time for any customer being turned up is, please don't quote me on this, but I believe it's less than two weeks. Um, so somebody calls, they will have internet service delivered to them within two weeks. Uh, and we want to maintain that regardless of if we have a hundred accounts in process or if we have 10 accounts in process, uh, we're kind of creating the mechanisms in place to, to make sure we do maintain that customer service. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the major impetuses for our operation is that we're a competitive industry. We're not, we're not operating as if we're a monopoly in this area. And, uh, you know, realistically, people can get in internet from somebody else. The reason we're better is not only because the tech is better, but the customer service are calling somebody who is vested in the community who wants to help and and you know is here to provide support and that's that's been a large foundational driver of kind of all of the decision making for our operation and and you know build out prospects um you know we want to the reason we've been a little hesitant to push out a service will be available by this date is because we don't want people to call us and us not to be able to deliver service yet to them. Um, we don't wanna be overwhelmed. We don't want that bad first impression. We really wanna make sure we're, we're you know, as clean as we possibly can be with the customer service and the turnaround and all the pieces of it. And, and Shelly, just so you know that you know, we've hired, we're going to probably hire on track because that's what they do. They do bulk service installations, you know, Lightworks comes in, puts all the cable in, puts all the drops in, everything is ready to go. And then let your on track just basically hooks up from there and goes to the house. You know, right. these new builds like six canyons, we're actually built into the building. So turning somebody up is fairly simple. Hopefully lofts will be that way. Hopefully Bell Rippy will be that way. So we're migrating into these MDUs as they come online. Then we're also going to have another person uh, start working for us here soon in a part-time uh, uh, job that will also start working on MDUs and start working on those pieces of the puzzle too. Cause on track really kind of wants to do the residential. I want to hit and get 15 houses hooked up today. I'm going to get 15 houses hooked up tomorrow. Um, okay. So Great. And once they, once we did the main build out, then we'll start bringing it back in house and probably doing more services ourselves. Okay. Thanks. 
All right. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Matt, for the double header there. And uh, it's exciting. I think we're all really excited to see those things come through. And uh, uh, please just let me know as soon as you can get our valued employee, Steve Boyd, up and going. I, I'm always, always looking out for him, especially as we all work remotely. It's important to have our, our COO um, having the best internet possible. Uh, Appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Jonathan. One quick one. We'll be bringing this back. Eagle's going to look at this with their town uh, council here soon. Um, once they may, they're agreed to it, we'll bring it back to you guys. So you'll have another chance to look at it, read through it, ask questions, but we'll bring it back in a formal version. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. All right. Uh, next item, tours and promotion work session. Um, who needs to be promoted? Just raise your hand. Let's see. I'm just going to start promoting people who I recognize. <laughs> I need to be promoted if you can. I want to share my screen. Ma'am, you are promoted. You were the first person I promoted. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Uh, Angie, did I, should I bring you over to Angie? Just raise your hand if so, or if anybody else wants to get promoted. It's a big tent today. No? Okay. Lisa, knock yourself out. Okay. May I share my screen? That'd be great. All right. I'm gonna. We'll see if this works. Can you see my presentation? I might move you guys a little. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we can see great. It's wonderful. Awesome. All right. So uh, I just wanted to give you a nice overview of what's been going on. Um, real short overview about what happened, because um, we all know that last year wasn't the best. So, um, of course, here are the low lights of 2020. As you all know, uh, we had a major fire as well as a pandemic. So that did not help our um, accommodations tax or our economy and in the tourism sector for sure. But uh, I wanted to give you a quick snapshot of accommodations tax receipts over the year. Uh, you know, we were tracking really well, trending up for the first two months. And then mid-March, boom, uh, fell off because of um, COVID scare, uh, of course. I thought it was just a scare, but then it became a real thing, which was uh, really wild. Um, of course, April tanked because we had a mandated closure of the lodges. Um, May, the attractions were still closed, so we still had a really uh, low May. And then June, by mid-month, we started to come back. We started to ramp up with the attractions open. July, we had our Glenwood Gold Summer Stimulus uh, kicked off, and we were doing great until mid-August when, of course, the fire started and shut down I-70. So... Um, that really tanked. And then we reintroduced our Glenwood Gold campaign um, and extended it through the month of November. And boy, we got national and international coverage and sold out of those, uh, those great Glenwood Gold $100 uh, gifts to uh, incentivize visitors who stayed two nights or more on a Sunday through Thursday check-in. And, and it worked um, tremendously. Our October was actually up by almost 8% over last year, which was the biggest gain we got all year. Um, so we ended the year 30% uh, down uh, cumulatively, but uh, that was to be expected. And um, we are going to be coming back really strong. Uh, here are a couple little highlights of things that we did. Uh, we told people during the shutdown, you know, plan, plan ahead, don't cancel, reschedule. So here's a little reschedule clip.
that worked very well. People shared that all over the place, all over social media. Uh, we got a lot of people telling us about what they were going to do when they were able to travel uh, to Glenwood Springs. So, so that was a great, great thing. As I told you, the Glenwood uh, Gold Summer Stimulus went really, really well. We were very, very pleased with uh, the outpouring of support and the number of visitors that we got uh, from all over, uh, including Texas. Um, you know, they wanted to come here. So uh, they still want to come here because I, whoops, this is going to be a problem. Hopefully I can get to the next one here. So here's a fun thing that we did during 2020. Uh, we decided to expand our gifts. So those of you who um, do a lot on Instagram know that there are gifts and, uh, and you can go into your little Giphy section and, and we have our very own Glenwood Springs uh, gifts to add to your Instagram stories and your Instagram posts. And these were the ones that we created for, uh, some of the ones that we created for the winter season. You'll see the little wings there. Those are because of the, our wonderful new art in town. And that goes along well with our other gifts that we had already um, started. So here's some of those, really fun, Hanging Lake Life, uh, Greetings from Glenwood Springs, Hot Springs and Me. We got the biker going through Glenwood Canyon and a couple of the uh, Glenwood Adventure Park gifts. And these um, are really well received. And I wanted to point them out because they're the only, we are the only city in Colorado that has our very own gifts. So um, we can be very proud of ourselves because uh, we're ahead of the game. Uh, so we, uh, we've beat everybody to the punch. There are other entities in Colorado, like the Rockies, um, you know, baseball team, and uh, Pikes Peak has some gifts, but but we're the only community, so still, yay! All right, so um, we we changed our media strategy just very um, little, actually, for 2021. We we have less money to work with, um, but we're able to uh, get some money from our reserves to make it almost as good as it has been in the past. Um, we wanna generate obviously um, more awareness of Glenwood Springs, uh, incorporating TV and radio more and utilizing more digital tactics. And we um, have really pushed out a message of safety and that we have wide open spaces and a lot of things you can do outdoors. So um, we're uh, trying to not only um, target the family market, but also empty nesters, sinks and dinks, and those are single income, no kids, and double income, no kids. I just like to say sinks and dinks because it's super fun. Um, so we do a lot of placements with uh, OTA partners like Expedia, TripAdvisor. Uh, we have share through opportunities where we put um, ads in regular apps that people look at. So it just kind of pops up in an app and I'll show you uh, an example of that. And then of course, we always place our media in uh, to build shoulder seasons because we know we're really well situated for summer months. And so we, uh, we do place media to build spring and fall uh, going into the winter season as well. And here is one of our winter messages. Uh, we, we went with uncrowded escapes. I thought you'd like to see this video. And if that doesn't say you can go, whoops, ah, stop. You can go um, have a good time without a lot of people. I don't know what does. <laughs> Here's an example of our Pandora placement. We have uh, Pandora ads in the winter and spring. This one was one of our winter um, into spring. And we have uh, not only audio spots with a, ba with a banner, uh, but we've got a mobile landing page on there that links uh, then links people on to uh, visit Glenwood. So that um, is something that you can hear when you listen to Pandora. It's a lot of fun. We just updated our spring 
uh, spring add uh, from the winter that we had. And this I want to show you, uh, play, pay particular attention to the top of the screen. This runs on the altitude channel along with an ad that we've placed, but this is called a flow through banner. And you'll see the banner at the top of the screen. This is a real quick clip, but super fun. We do this for the abs game, games and also for the nuggets. So I hope you were watching the, uh, the flow through and not the game. <laughs> All right, now I have to try to get out of this one. It looks like nobody's watching the game. <laughs> What's that, Tony? I said it looks like there's nobody there watching the game, but on TV, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see if I can get out of this without too much trouble. Okay. Ooh, there we go. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide and then hit present. So we'll do that again. These are always tricky when you have videos, but it's so much more fun. Uh, so here's an example of our, flow, our share through ads. So you might be reading um, an app that's um, a sports app and you're catching up on tennis and football and so forth. And all of a sudden you have a little ad by Glenwood Springs right there, uh, which clicks through again to our visit Glenwood page and gives them all kinds of great reasons to come here. We try to pick a catchy um, photo uh, and it fits the season of what we're doing. And there's a Rolling Stone app on the side there for those of you who love to, uh, to hang out with the Rolling Stones, um, <laughs> Rolling Stone um, magazine. Anyway, so that's that's an idea of share through. And then I wanted to give a little uh, insight on the mother load giveaway that we did. So we did this uh, giveaway. We had some money left over from the, um, the Visit Glenwood um, summer stimulus that was not picked up. So um, because of fires in the state and because of a big snowstorm that happened while we were trying to finish up those Glenwood Gold Visitor Stimulus $100 gifts, uh, we ended up with $12,000 of the $100,000 that we had to use for that that was not picked up. So what we did was create a um, visitor survey, visitor demo survey on visitglenwood.com. We sent the survey out to over 40,000 um, people on our distribution list on our e-newsletter, ask, ask people to take the survey. They would then come to a landing page on Visit Glenwood. And um, we gained uh, over 1,300 people took the survey. So we gained a lot of visitor demographics and, um, and we made it available for 12 days. So pretty good to have it was, it was closer to 1,400 actually. So, you know, it was a lot of people that participated. And then we randomly picked 12, 100 or $1,000 Glenwood Gold winners. And those represented six states. Most came from Colorado. Um, we had about uh, seven from Colorado, but then we had California, Florida, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Texas uh, as well. So that was a really good thing. And what we gained was some insight into who's visiting. So we have age ranges, our um, biggest age range as far as taking the survey, and it was just a 10 question survey. So it did not take long to take the survey. We had 50 to 69 in the largest category at 54.6%. Uh, and then at 29.1%, we have the 30 to 49 uh, age range. The 18 to 29 didn't show up so much. They were a smaller percentage and the 70 plus was uh, 12%. And have they visited Glenwood Springs? I thought this was interesting. Some had in the past 12 months, in the past 24 months, some said uh, it's been over two years, but the majority said not yet, but they can't wait. Of course, that was the answer on the, the survey. Not yet, but I can't wait. So um, that was very exciting that uh, we have that many people in our database that just are really dreaming of travel and want to come to Glenwood Springs and haven't had the opportunity yet. Uh, another great thing to see was that most of the people that took the survey said, uh, although, you know, of course, some haven't stayed overnight in Glenwood because they haven't been here yet, uh, most who have been here stayed in a hotel or motel, 
which helps, of course, with our accommodations tax receipts and therefore the budget. So that is a good thing. And what time of year will you plan to visit? I really thought this was great because it's showing that people are stretching out into the shoulder seasons well. Uh, we still need to work on the January, February time period, of course, and November, December is still soft. But you see that March, April is very strong. And then, of course, May, June, which is still softer than the July, August time frame. And September, October is growing. And, uh, and that is a really good sign for us here in Glenwood Springs. Spread those folks out through the year, uh, spread the economy out and bring in more taxes. And this is a great snapshot of where these uh, zip codes were. So you can see almost every state is, uh, is here. And um, so we had response from all of those states. And then you can see, of course, that Colorado was the most with 413 and um, Utah 57. So we did have, and 35 from Texas. So that was, that was pretty, um, pretty good. So moving on, um, we wanted, we did a, an, an Instagram takeover with the Colorado Tourism Office. So we work very closely with the Colorado Tourism Office, office uh, at colorado.com. We get a lot of leads, in fact, hundreds of leads every week that we send brochures to. So that's one of the, the things that we get from our um, marketing dollars at colorado.com. But we also do Instagram takeovers. So we did one just in February. Um, the rules are please be scenic, please don't be too salesy. Um, use stories that, that look authentic and, and show things to do and people in fun places. Um, so we did 16 posts, multiple stories. The total post likes were almost 50,000. Our most popular was almost 10,000. And story engagement, uh, most stories uh, received over 1,000 views and a handful were over 5,000 views. And we, we looked at other um, people who'd done it before us, other communities, and, and we by far exceeded the numbers uh, because we really posted pretty pictures. And here's some of the pretty pictures that we posted. These were actually the top, um, the most favorite posts of people. So this was great, these beautiful uh, sunset photos. And, um, and of course, this winter one that, that we use uh, that is the whole valley. So very happy that that worked out so well. And we also just did a spring uh, visit Colorado co-op, which is the one here on the left and showed these lovely ladies relaxing at the Glenwood Hot Springs pool. And then this clicked onto um, how to come to Glenwood Springs and the most fun things to do to check off your, your spring break list. And then this is our spring, uh, is our middle name spot. This one um, I'm gonna play is a high crop, which uh, is used for, for mobile uh, and social media. So that's just a fun little 15 second one. And then we've got uh, some really great placements in the local airports. So we've got uh, Eagle and Aspen airports. And this uh, on the left is just the, the side panels. So this goes on the right, right and left of the video. And just, um, whoops, here comes the video, sorry. Similar to the other one, only longer. And this is the side panel, Spring is our middle name, and Glenwood Springs. So these videos are actually uh, up longer than, um, than they would be normally because last year was such a bad year, they've given us extra time. So we're really happy about that. Uh, animated Facebook, Google ads, and uh, targeted ads, these are, one, these are for empty nesters. So what these do is click through each of these panels. And there's actually an extra book now panel uh, with a pretty flower on it. But this is um, showing what empty nesters might want to do when they're in Glenwood Springs. And then here's what families might want to do while they're in Glenwood. And here are what couples might want to do while they're in Glenwood. 
So it just uh, shows a nice diversity of uh, things that we're showing online in our digital marketing. And of course, we are um, taking charge and leading the charge at the Hanging Lake Partnership. So we, we did uh, provide a press release. We disseminated that on our Meltwater platform to a national audience. Um, the reopening press release, of course, we're going to start taking reservations on um, our Hanging Lake page on visitglenwood.com starting April 1st. Um, it, we've updated that page right now with all the pertinent information. And in the next week, we'll, we will be getting ready to uh, put the, the booking widget right onto the page. We're also going to be adding a live chat um, to the page. And we'll, we'll go ahead and fund that and then have H2O Ventures man it during their uh, business hours. So they were very excited about this, um, the ability to answer questions right away um, instead of keeping people waiting. So, and Heidi uh, Panko and I are both um, on the Hanging Lake stakeholder meetings. And so we, we serve on that subcommittee that helps plan things uh, regarding Hanging Lake. So we're, we're happy to be a part of that partnership. And we're also uh, great collaborators in the Roaring Fork Valley. As you may have heard, we are a gold level ride center and we were designated that by the International Mountain Biking Association. That has garnered us a lot of great press. Uh, we, we actually just got a craft uh, grant and that's through the uh, Colorado Rural, Rural Academy for Tourism and that's sponsored by the Colorado Tourism Office. And so we will be able to market the Gold Level Ride Center for all of our mountain biking trails throughout the valley uh, collaboratively with the other communities in the valley. And here is a wonderful uh, award that we won. We won the Colorado Tourism Office Governor's Tourism Award for Outstanding Community Tourism Initiative. And here's the video. a ski resort, and a nonprofit joined forces, they achieved a designation that's one of only seven in the world, an International Mountain Bicycling Association Gold Level Ride Center. Their work brings attention to each town, the region, and Colorado as a whole, inviting visitors to experience multiple days riding 300 miles of diverse, high-quality safety camp trails, as well as the areas exhilarating. The communities of the Roaring Fork Valley include Aspen, Basalt, Carbondale, Glenwood Springs, and Snowmass Village developed trails to satisfy riders' demands while also focusing on all important sustainability efforts. Working with public and private land managers over two years, the group built additional mileage and made improvements to the Valley's trail system that propelled them from bronze to gold status. This year's winner for Outstanding Community Tourism Initiative is Roaring Fork Valley Goes for the Gold and the Aspen Snowmass Roaring Fork Valley Gold Level IMA Ride Center. We were very excited to be part of that uh, collaboration and uh, it's going to reap us a lot of benefits in the future. Um, now, some of you know about this and some of you may have heard a few things, but I really have to um, extend more information on this. This is Rocky Mountaineer's newest US route. The Rocky Mountaineer is a luxury train journey. Uh, they have several routes in Canada, and of course, um, they have not been able to run those routes because Canada is still pretty much um, closed to tourism. So um, they're starting to open up. Just recently, I read that. But um, the Rocky Mountaineer has worked with us for over two years now. And they were initially going to launch the route between Denver and Moab in uh, 2022 or 2023. And because of COVID and because the other routes in Canada were closed, they ramped up this new route, the Rockies to the Red Rocks, and they will start it mid-August. So it's gonna start on August 15th. And initially it was going to run through October 15th for this first year. Now, of course, they pushed it back because of COVID. They wanted to make sure things were, were going to be great. And um, so we have gotten a ton of advertising uh, by way of media hits for this. So Rocky Mountaineer um, placements have generated an equivalent advertising value of $8.19 million 
since the root announcement early November. So it's been on Fox News, on TV, on uh, local news, online, Forbes. It's been in all kinds of uh, great travel and leisure and, uh, and Chicago Tribune, all kinds of um, amazing um, placements in magazines, online, in um, newspapers, in major cities and international placements in Germany, Portugal, UK, and Mexico. And it's just um, an incredible, exciting thing to be part of. I, I get to talk with these folks from the Rocky Mountaineer um, weekly at least, and they're developing all kinds of great information for their passengers who will be here on not weekends, but on um, Monday, or I'm sorry, Sunday, Monday, and then Wednesday, Thursday. So they're gonna be coming on weeknights that we're not super busy. And they're gonna be bringing initially 150 people per day, different people each time, and uh, they will stay the night. So this is gonna help us um, get our accommodations tax back up. I'm real super excited about it. Um, so this year it'll be a shorter time frame, um, but it's going to be, um, great for the community. And it's going to bring folks who understand travel and who are excited about travel and who want to spend money. And, uh, and that is, is the biggest thing. We're working with uh, the DDA to make sure that our downtown retailers and our um, local restaurants know that these folks are going to be coming on these uh, days. And so they might want to consider staying open later. Uh, this Rock and Mountaineer campaign is something the Colorado Tourism Office decided to co-op with Trail Finders, which is a huge UK um, uh, travel agency. And so they co-opt um, to the tune of $7,500 and then uh, Trail Finders matched it. So this is telling about the trip from Denver to Moab with the overnight in Glenwood Springs. And they just announced uh, this past week that the initial season has been extended through November 19th. So it's, it's a pretty exciting um, first year. And this is a, um, a year of many. They're, they're planning to um, at least have a 10 to 15 year contract. So, um, and that's with Union Pacific, of course, but they're, they're very excited to be here. They've been here multiple times uh, checking out the place. So, so this is gonna be a fantastic thing for, for Glenwood Springs. And just uh, to say a little more about our top PR placements, we have um, an equivalent adverti advertising value of 44 million. And, and this is not the Rocky Mountaineer stuff. This is a lot of other, well, some of it is, but most of it is just general, a great place to visit. Um, this of course on travel and leisure, the scenic Colorado Resort City will pay you hundred dollars to visit. That was during our Glenwood Gold. And most of that got picked up after um, we announced that we were trying to uh, recover after a fire, a major fire. So that worked um, a little bit in our favor to, to get that going. And that is the end of my presentation. Are there questions? I can stop sharing. Let's Go, see. Tony. Go ahead, Tony. I was trying to unmute. You know, I think someday I'll figure out how to unmute quickly. Um, well, thanks so much. I appreciate it, Lisa. Um, uh, my one concern about Hanging Lake is like, I do you, are those like updated pictures? I mean, it got a little bit of bad press during the fire. And then I think I've heard from some friends in Denver, like, can I go to Hanging Lake? Did, you know, did it burn up? And I'm like, no, it didn't burn up. You know, so, um, is there anything we can put out or is that something you've already done? Just like ensure and reassure people that it's safe to go there. It's perfectly pristine. It didn't get damaged substantially yes. and everything's okay. Thanks. Yeah, actually, thank you, Tony. Uh, that's a really good question. There's There has been a lot of press, um, especially local and regional press regarding the fact that um, that the lake was, was saved and that it didn't burn up. And uh, the, the U.S. Forest Service has put out a lot of announcements and it, it has gained traction uh, nationally as well. So people know that uh, it's still going to be a beautiful place to visit, that it was a miracle actually that it was saved and that even 
the trail was not burned. Uh, none of the bridges on the trail were burned, which is really amazing. It, it is very, very exciting. Uh, I think we're gonna have a huge turnout. And usually on April 1st, when we launch a new season of uh, reservations, it, we just get a flood of people that, that want to book for, you know, August or September, or October, you know, they're just really excited about it. So that's a really good question. Thank you. Ingrid, uh, you know, what, hold on one second, Ingrid. Uh, Heather Montrose Cowan, go for it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was great. A uh, quick question. I was curious about how long the stop is for the Rocky Mountaineers. The, the train ride, is it kind of, is it just an overnight or is there actually time that they can come and do some dining and activities in the area or is it a pretty quick turnaround? It is a quick turnaround, Heather. Um, they uh, Coming from Denver on a Sunday night, they will be here about 5 p.m. So they won't have dinner on the train. Now this is a luxury train. It's it's like taking a cruise on the, tr on the rails. So, so they're gonna feed them and they're gonna wine and dine them, but they won't feed them dinner before they get here on that side of the route. It's a two day journey. And we have heard from Rocky Mountaineer folks that people have asked, can we extend in Glenwood Springs? It looks like there's a lot to do there. Well, no, they can't. This is a two day journey. They're gonna spend the night and then they're gonna go on to their other destination. However, I have been working with several um, tour operators who are trying to get tours to um, start in Moab. So when people are coming from Denver to Moab, they can get on a tour that comes back into Colorado and maybe flies back out of Denver. So we might get them for another couple of days. That's what we're trying to, um, to do. So that's working. Coming from Moab, they're gonna get here at 7 p.m. So that's also unfortunate. Um, you know, so two days a week, they'll come from Denver, they'll get here at five. Two days a week, they'll come from Moab, they'll get here at seven. So that's why we wanna really work with the downtown um, core and get them to, to know when they're coming and know when they need to extend their hours so that we can show off Glenwood in such a way that, that people will say, we gotta come back here. Thank you. You're welcome. Ingrid. Lisa, I love all the gifts. I think they're they're so fun. And I'm wondering, are they being used in any other application? Are we making them into stickers? Are they available for purchase? What's what? Where are we with that? Um, no, we we do have a couple of them that are stickers. We have okay. the hanging lake one. That's a sticker. Obviously, the water's not moving. <laughs> and we do have a really nice sticker of the canyon, the round one that was on uh, in the middle of that. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, no, we haven't created any more stickers. Um, we do give those away here in the visitor center. And, mm -hmm. but that's really about the, you know, Instagram is kind of one of those things where, you know, it's, it's the easiest place to use a GIF. Um, I got to use them in this presentation, which made me feel good. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll, I can send you all the link and you can, you know, stick them on, you can stick them in your, um, your email, signature or something that would be fun yeah so and i do appreciate that opportunity i think more than anything it's kind of a vein to, of getting to an explanation than when i visited other cities and towns a lot of times you'll see stickers that that there's some continuity in a lot of the tourist stores and right. i i would actually encourage you guys to utilize those great visuals and and maybe use those in different applications and maybe make stickers and sell them to some of the local businesses at some discount. I think it's great marketing. I yeah, like it. thank you. Yeah, they're fun and they're, yeah. Our, our job is not to make money on stuff yeah. and is to yeah. give stuff away. So as soon as we get our budget back up, we can do things like that. That'll yeah. be a good, that's a very good idea, Ingrid. Thank you. And then a second question I have is, you know, obviously we've, we've given away a lot of Glenwood gold and I'm curious what the what is our usage amount and I might have missed it but like even of the 12,000 mother load how much of that has been redeemed and is there an expiration date to it and if it doesn't get used where does that where does that money go to how does that get played up okay so just to remind you all um, the $50,000 came out of the tourism reserve reserve fund and $50,000 was matched by Garfield County and um so we used obviously the majority of that in the $100 um, Glenwood Gold gifts. Those were pretty much redeemed uh, right away because people had to be here in order to get them. Mm -hmm. 
and then they use them on their dinner or their hotel or a lot of, a lot of retailers um, that are participating said they use them in their stores. So that was really great. The, um, the mother load giveaway, I just mailed certified um, a week and a half ago. So those recipients, of course, um, all said that they were planning to use it within a year. So we'll see how that goes. But um, what happens to it if it doesn't get used? Very good question. Um, I, I am told that after five years, it, it goes to the state hmm. uh, because it's like a gift certificate. And um, yeah, so let's hope that they use them within five years. There's no expiration on the ones that we sent out to visitors. Okay, thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. You're welcome. Thanks, Shelly. Hi, Lisa. Great Hi, presentation. I, you guys have done, just did a fantastic job on marketing. I really thank love you. the videos and the placement and everything. You've really done a great job. So thank I you. especially like that, the, the one you showed early in the presentation of the winter outreach, kind of the uncrowded unresort. I think that really yeah. kind of captured a nice essence. So, but Thank I'm you. excited about the Rocky Mountain near to and what I've read about it. It sounds like a great thing. And the idea of bringing people, visitors to town without a car and they can come here and stay. I'm, I'm curious how it works. Are, are they, as part of their package, do they go to a specific hotel or is that all kind of worked out with the company then? Yes, as part of the package, what we did to help them was identify um, hotels that, that, well, they identified the hotels that they thought would be best because they came and checked us out ahead of time. Okay. But um, so uh, what we did was connect them with those, those people who could then make the contract work. So they are using to start with for this initial year, they're using the Hotel Denver, uh, the Hotel Colorado and the Hot Springs Lodge. So with the package, of course, it, it'll depend, the, the price of the package will depend on what accommodations they choose. So okay. I don't know, I haven't looked at like how they broke it down uh, in terms of which hotels cost more, that kind of thing. But you know, if they're staying at the Hotel Denver, they don't have as far to walk. So there are people obviously that won't, will have mobility issues. It'll be easier for them to stay there. Um, of course, they were very excited that we have this wonderful pedestrian bridge and elevators, hello, so that we could get up there and across to, uh, to the other two properties. And a lot of their um, visitors are interested in historic properties. And then those people that wanna stay at the Hot Springs Lodge will get Obviously the pool uh, will be included in their stay. So there are the, those kinds of- um, Different packages. Package right. Okay. Yeah. And my main question about that was, is there also, do they set up kind of a seamless transportation to get them to the hotel and-, and Yes. So what they're gonna do um, in Glenwood Springs, they don't have to have transportation unless someone has a mobility issue okay. because of the short walk across the bridge. Oh, no. um, okay. Yeah. So they're, they were very, very happy about Glenwood Springs and the ability to just walk to those places. As the route expands and they anticipate that this will be so popular. I mean, they've obviously already um, made it a longer time period this year through mm -hmm. November. Um, so they expect this is going to be an excellent route and that people are going to really um, love it and book it. And as COVID and, and people get vaccinated as that kind of uh, goes to the wayside, there will be more and more, especially international people who will book this. The, uh, it is, Rocky Mountaineer is huge in the international market. They're huge okay. in Australia, the UK, Germany. These people love uh, to go on those Canadian routes. And so they're already talking about, you know, 2022 at least to get started coming over. Um, I've done uh, a, a UK um, presentation and one for Australia and then one for their, um, the website so that they can show their travel agents. Um, I just completed the first uh, week of March, a Go West Summit, which is all international tour operators. And they all wanted to know about the Rocky Mountaineer. 
I got to talk to people I don't normally get to talk to because they're really big in the tourism industry and um, they don't know Glenwood Springs. All of a sudden now everybody knows Glenwood Springs and it's because of Rocky Mountaineer. So we are- Nice. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Well, great, great work on that. So it's Thank you. nice to see that come here. Thanks. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, just briefly comment on that. Uh, we had a discussion about this at DDA this week, and I think we talked about the chambers. Well, Lisa, you might know I've talked about it in two or three meetings, but it's going to be really important that we get the community, particularly the retail merchants behind this, the restaurants behind this, and then night when they come in at seven, um, I don't know if they're going to be fed on the train or not. My impression was they still be available for dinner. We need to be open later on those nights to make sure. So we're going to be trying to schedule some meetings as soon as we can. Um, I spoke to Christian uh, Hotel Colorado. He might be able to bring together a larger group of merchants, uh, even in today's COVID standards, so we can begin making sure the people are open and we're doing this. The impacts on that mid-city, which is what we are, in other places has been tremendous. So it has taken small communities and made them into bigger communities, driven hotel construction, things like that. So this could be a huge impact on our economy. And it, it we're, will, we're need Charlie. To um, the coming back from Moab, I didn't mention this, and, and I'm sorry, I think that was Heather's question earlier or Ingrid's. Um, coming back from Moab, they'll get here at seven. They will have a light meal uh, coming back because it, it's getting late, but they're going to want to do, you know, like fine wine and, and go out to dessert or whatever it is. So they're still going to want to uh, experience uh, the community and they've got money to spend and they're excited to spend it. From what I've been told, these, these, the clientele for this uh, train is, is really high end and they're not snobby high end. They're nice high end that really want to and I hope I didn't offend anyone by saying snobby high end, but uh, I'll say it again. But there, there are people who enjoy travel and who just really want to get out and, and enjoy a destination and learn about the destination. So I think it's going to really um, do very, very well for us. And also um, the thing that I didn't mention or didn't explain is that in years uh, to come, they'll be expanding those hotels because they'll need to. They'll need to have bigger room blocks in different places. And when that happens, then they will contract with um, a transportation entity to take people from, from the train station to, uh, to the hotels, so. Yeah. And the numbers, the last thing I think Lisa didn't mention is the numbers next spring, uh, assuming COVID will be gone, are gonna double, so. I mean, it's a right. lot. And they'll be, and they'll be uh, mid-May through at least mid-October in following years. This first year is only because of COVID. Uh, Paula. I should know this just because I sit in the tourism board meetings, Lisa. Now, a great presentation. Um, has there been any talk on the um, uh, Rocky Mountaineer? And I know we want to get people downtown and in the businesses, but small tours up to Doc Holiday or that type of stuff, home tours. I'm just hearing what you're saying about that kind of Old West thing. And mm -hmm. I didn't know if any of that was being looked at. Um, well, I, I have a great presentation. I can send it to um, somebody, maybe Deborah or Sarah, and they can send it out to you guys, or I can send it um, blind carbon copy to all of you. <laughs> but uh, the, it's a presentation, a 10 minute presentation I did um, that just outlines all of the history in our area and talks about Doc Holiday. And we do have um, the walking tours available for them. So we plan to extend hours at the visitor center too for the during this, you know, on those nights so that people can stop in and, and get information. But there, um, the the people that do the history part of the tour, they provide a um, like a manual uh, that they that they have on the train, and then all of the tour guides on the train talk about what's happening along the way. And then they'll talk up Glenwood Springs and they'll tell about all of this, all of these tales of Glenwood Springs, um, including, you know, how the um, uh, I-70 was built through the canyon and things like that. So they're, they're um, in, inspirational stories. I've been on some um, Zoom calls with these people who develop the stories and then they're in touch also with Bill Kite. So he's gonna give them a lot of historic information. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Bill didn't do some kind of 
uh, historic tour over at the Hotel Colorado on the nights that they're there. So Absolutely. I think he's working on that. Great, thank you. Welcome. Uh, any other questions or comments? Um, Lisa, I think it's just really important, especially the nights where people get in at seven. I know it's been mentioned a couple of times to make sure that our businesses are open. Please let us know that what we can do here on council to help encourage, <laughs> uh, can, can I come, uh, you know, carrot or stick. We would love, uh, for those businesses to stay open a little bit later. I think that's going to be key to no one wants those uh, folks coming in from Moab at seven o'clock and finding the town rolled up. And uh, we, we just have to have that. So yeah. um, thank you very much for the presentation. It was oh. really informative. Thanks for all the great work you do. Uh, Shirley, do you have one less comment? It just this is our normal meeting with the commission. And we kind of talked a lot about what the plan is. Is there anything you need from us as a commission uh, to the council? That's a question we always ask. And I don't want to let it go. I know we're getting close to our dinner time, but I want to make sure that we don't leave you guys hanging. Are you you're leaving the board hanging, you mean? Yeah, is there anything you need from us? To get the um, well, I, I did send some information regarding um, the qualifications for the board. So I think you guys probably have that to take a look at. It's just um, a, a very small change in the citizen seat. So if we can change that from two that have to have absolutely no interest at all in tourism to three that may have an interest. I think that wording will work and I'm sure Carl can weigh in on that, but you know, that would be assumed that they may or may not have an interest, but at least it's more inclusive. Um, and we had a long discussion, Paula can tell you <laughs> on that particular topic. And that's what the board kindly kind of came down to. And I'm sorry, we don't have a lot of board members on tonight. We, we, they were all geared up for 315 and then 415 happened and some of them had to actually have other things going on. So sorry about that. Deborah. Yeah, Lisa, I was just gonna tell you, I think I'm shooting for a meeting in April to bring the board discussion back to council. And that's in plenty of time, except that we do have one seat unfilled. So the seat that's unfilled is a citizen seat and we have three alternates that um, have a business interest, either direct or indirect. And one of those fine folks could fill it if the, the discussion was sooner. But April is right around the corner. Why was I thinking July? <laughs> Plenty of time, Deborah. <laughs> that's great, <laughs> thank you. All right, any further comments or questions? Lisa, again, thank you. Thank you for, for all the people who volunteer on the board and the tourism board. Um, we really appreciate it. You guys are super valuable to promoting Glenwood Springs as a band, brand and as a community. So thank you very much for everything you do. Thank you. And yes, thanks to all the board members and thanks to city council. Appreciate you. All right, guys, we are adjourned until our regular meeting time at 6.15.